Welcome to Archmere Academy and to this first episode of a tour of the Archmere Estate here in Claymont, Delaware. I'm Michael Marinelli, Headmaster of Archmere, a 1976 graduate of the high school that was founded in 1932 by the Norbertine priests from De Pere, Wisconsin. Joining me today is another graduate, Tom Inertia from the class of 1961. Tom and I both have an avid interest in the historic restoration and preservation of the building and uh, a lot of work has been done in researching the building that was built originally by John and Hel Helena Raskob in 1918. It was their home for them and their uh, 12, actually 13 children. Uh, one of the projects undertaken this particular year, uh, actually since our 100th anniversary of the building, is a gathering information for a book about the building which Tom is authoring. So he has a wealth of information that he'd like to share with us and we'll begin with a discussion of the basement. And that's a pretty interesting place that does more than just, as he says, hold up the outside walls of the building. So please join us as we begin our virtual tour of the basement. So here we are at the bottom of the stairs in a basement hallway, and uh, it's a pretty interesting place. It certainly needs some uh, plastering and painting for sure, but uh, why don't we uh, take a look around and we see these double doors over here with a lot of signs on them. Tom, what, what's behind the doors? Well, what we're gonna find behind these doors is something you're, you're likely to expect to find. We'll find some things that are not expected a little bit later, but let's take a look and see how the main part of the basement plant works. Take a look around the building, and obviously this is where the heating plant was located in 1918. If we can pan around and see, see the boilers over here on the side, of course these are not the original boilers. The original boilers were coal burners, and there would have been a lot more soot and smoke and dust uh, involved in the area down here. And you can see that it's a pretty, pretty large space. So we create steam heat down here and we're going to distribute that steam to other parts of the building to hit the radiators. And uh, of course we had some areas that had forced, uh, forced air heat uh, and others that simply had radiator heat, radiator heat as well. So let's move down into the, into the space a little bit more. What I wanted to point out was how big this area is, because in addition to the heating plants, we have electrical distribution. Raskob had probably the best of everything that money could buy installed here at our field. Um, I understand that the original electrical system was a three-phase system. Um, now I looked up three-phase and I'm not really sure I can understand it at all. All I know is that it could handle a lot of power and if you had an installation that used a lots of motors and equipment, it was a much better system to install. You know, most residents are simply going to have, you plug in your toaster, you plug in your hair dryer, you have a few reading lights and that's fine. Single phase works. But from what I understand, if you're going to be running a lot of power equipment, especially heavy motors, which Archmere did, three phase was the way to go. This is a pretty sad looking piece of equipment now, but I honestly do remember when I was a student, this is white marble. 
imagine having your electrical distribution system mounted in beautiful white marble, like a, a church or a cathedral. You can see the major knife switches down here that would have controlled the, the various boilers once they switched into getting the steam uh, generated from the boilers. All of the circuits that go through the house were controlled from here as well. And of course, uh, the technical people that uh, took care of Raskob's equipment and engineering would have been on duty down here pretty much uh, at, any, at any time. As I said, there were lots and lots of motors throughout the entire complex that would have been run on a three-phase system. I would ask if you can get around the corner. Maybe we could move around the side here and take a peek behind this board. You'll see the remnants. Now, we can't get in there, but you can see where all the wires came out and then would hit pipes and conduits and be channeled to wherever it actually had to go. So Tom, this is a really unusual system for a residential installation. As you said, you would see this in the day in probably manufacturing or large industry installations that had to power large motors. But obviously, Archmere was a large estate. And as you said, Mr. Raskob always wanted the best of the best and was on sort of the cutting edge with technology. So that's something unique. But is there, are there any other uniquenesses about this particular basement? Actually, there is. There were two other engineering installations that uh, were installed down here. We know where one of them was, and we're going, to visit, we're going to visit that very shortly. But the other one is kind of a mystery. Raskob installed a major refrigeration plant here in the basement, and it also had an ice plant. I know he ordered 12 uh, molds. Each one could make 50 pounds of ice, so the machinery could generate that amount of fresh ice at, at a push of a button, actually. Uh, it was an ammonia compression system, and that brought up the question to me, where in the world would they have put it? Because that makes a heck of a lot of noise. One of the things about putting equipment like this in the basement is to get it out of hearing range on the floors above, and it wouldn't disturb living in the house. And an ammonia compression system makes a racket uh, creating the cold brine. They could chill brine down to 25 degrees here. Uh, that's not, that wasn't even new technology, actually. You can go to England and they had cooling chambers at the end of the 19th century and primitive ice-making machinery at that point in time. Uh, just five, a few years earlier than this house was built, if you go down the road maybe four miles, uh, Alfred I. DuPont's new mansion at Namur had an ice making room and ammonia compression systems too. Uh, and they're pretty massive. All you have to do is really take a container, a metal container, fill it with fresh water and immerse it in the cold brine and pretty soon the fresh water just freezes into a solid block. In this case, 50 pound blocks. I'm not really sure what they did with 50 <laughs> pounds. I mean, if you used all of it, you got 600 pounds of ice. They had regular refrigeration uh, in the kitchens. So why did we need all that ice? I really don't know, but it could be made. I suspect one reason is you don't want to serve, since Mrs. Raskov's from the Eastern Shore, where do you serve your oysters on a half shell? You need a bed of ice. So things like that may have been part of the usage. Really don't know. But the big question was where in the heck was it? It wouldn't be right next to the boilers. Pretty, pretty unlikely for that to happen. Can you follow me this way? And I'm going to make a big guess. I'm thinking that this room might have had the refrigeration plant and the ice making equipment in it. And then the brine was simply pushed through pipes to the refrigeration units. Uh, what did they refrigerate? Well, the obvious is the refrigerators in the kitchen complex, the butler's pantry. Unusual, they had two ice water drinking fountains that were serviced by the refrigeration system. And, oh, don't ever forget Mrs. Raskob's furs. And then one more thing which viewers probably, many viewers probably don't realize, a lot of the patio was actually air conditioned. So that would be handled by the refrigeration system too. We know that Father Mikio, uh in the early 30s, after the Norbertines had purchased the 
uh, school or the estate for a school that he asked Mr. Raskob in a letter, may I remove the old ice making equipment from the basement so we know it was down, I do know it was down here. The question was where in the heck was it? I'm just guessing at this room. It seems a logical spot. And he wanted to put showers in for the football team. And I was looking at that outside door and I said, well, they could have come out down the outside steps and just slipped into here and not had to go near the electrical panels or whatever. And plus it was a small group of students anyway. So that's what I think happened here in this part of the basement, but there's a heck of a lot more basement that we can visit too. So let's figure out how the steam and the cold water and the brine and uh, things like that got where they're going. But first, let's stop and see the other unusual installation that's in this section of the basement, okay? And the, I said there would be another area that was unusual, and that is the estate laundry. Now, if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of people living at Archmere. He had a complete support staff. Uh, there were, according to his daughter, at least 20 people that took care of them in the house. They, many of them had to live here on the estate. So obviously their clothes had to be cleaned, washed, dried, ironed, and so on. Uh, certainly the Raskob's clothes would have been, and any guests that they had, and they entertained here very frequently. Uh, I believe that the original laundry, before the patio was actually built in 1916 to 18, was in an outbuilding which is now would have been actually sitting in the middle of I-495 down by the river, because that was all part of Archmere at one time. And then they would have simply transported the clothes and things back and forth. So when the patio was built, and we had this huge basement area that we're just beginning to take a look at, um, he's going to put in a modern laundry. And that means washing facilities, and washing facilities uh, will be followed by drying facilities. I found a fragment of a blueprint that said that they installed what they referred to as a hot air blast system. It sounds like Boeing would have designed it or something. But apparently there was a steam hookup to a heating generator on the floor right above us. And then, I'm going to guess, fans drove that air at great force down into some kind of contraption down here in which you would hang sheets, linens, towels, things of that nature. And then there would have been an ironing space because you're not going to send them back wrinkled, obviously, and unstarched, and a folding space. But there are clothes that maybe they didn't want to have uh, done mechanically, I mean at least dried mechanically. So outside, just on the east side behind the wall that we, I am looking at out there, there were drying yards. And they existed, at least that space existed, until the science building for Archmere Academy was built. And that's sitting on top of the original Raskob outdoor drying yards. Now these spaces are in pretty bad shape now. So we're going to turn, maybe we'll turn around if that's possible, and take a peek in. This first room we're going to give you a peek in would have been the room for all the washing and the wet work. That was kind of nasty business, actually, in those days. If you go back to the 18th century, this was the lowest of the low service jobs. Of course, it wasn't that way for the Raskobs. But if you go back socially, this was pretty much kept as far away from people as possible. Uh, let's take a look in this room. So what probably happened was all of the clothing would be delivered down here, down the clothes chute in the house or from the staff. And this was likely the washing room itself. I have no idea what the actual mechanical equipment uh, was that was installed down here. But you see you have plenty of steam pipes and, and things that would have been available. Big sinks over here to do soaking and oh, I guess all the things that one does uh, with a laundry. Not exactly sure where the drying and ironing, they would have been behind this wall. Uh, there's a door that's blocked off here, but this was always open. So this space, which is on, let's see, this is on the east side of the basement, and the drying yards would have been out that, out that window. So you could have communicated with the other two major spaces down here by simply walking down a little corridor inside this complex. So this is a pretty big operation here for the estate laundry. And of course, when everything was done, it was sent back to, into the appropriate rooms in the house, like the linen room for the mm -hmm. laundry. 
This is a fascinating space because it seems to have been abandoned for so many years, but so much of it has remained the same for a hundred years, you might say. Curious question, though, Tom, is, uh, okay, all the laundry was done over here and, you know, the linens, et cetera. Um, how was all of this transported, I mean, uh, you know, to get to all the different levels of the house? Uh, it would have to have been a pretty elaborate system for transporting clean laundry and probably gathering up dirty laundry to bring to this space. Yeah, actually, it was an interesting system. It wasn't as complicated as you might think, but it's very, very unusual. So we're going to take another little, little trip outside and down the hall. So currently this space is being used as part of the photography studio for our student art program, as you can see. But Tom, this was also part of the laundry at one point. Yeah, that's exactly what we believe. Uh, when I was a student, this was pretty much a junk area, old workbenches and things like that. So it's repurposed now, obviously. So we have no idea uh, what, how this was appointed uh, and what kind of machinery was done. Uh, was this the drying room? We're not sure. Was the drying in there? Uh, what about the ironing? You obviously had to have ironing as well. And if we went through that door, there's another room on that other side. So the entire complex would have been laundry. And that's what we think. But now what we have to do is get the laundry up to where it belongs in the rest of the house. So we're going to take another little field trip if you're ready. Well, Tom, this is a huge basement, and uh, we just had a really interesting walk. Well, let's tell the, the viewers that we were actually not in the basement of the patio. We were in the basement of the garage. The reason we started there was Raskob wanted to keep all of the equipment that caused noise, smells, soot, dirt, uh, that needed attention and staff work on it, away from the house itself. So I consider both of these basements, the basement that we just entered now under the patio itself, and the basement over in the manor or the garage as extensions of each other. So Tom, this is a pretty long corridor once again with a lot of small rooms stacked side by side. What were they all uh, used for? Well, this section of the house actually were on the south side of the house. Almost everything on the south side of the house except on the second floor, which has bedrooms, is for service. And it, I, you can probably see the stairs over here. This is a service block. This is the only internal staircase that goes completely to the attic and down. And that meant the staff who could walk through the tunnel from the garage or bring equipment in and out could use those stairs and be out of sight of any of the people in the patio, guests, family, and so forth. But if you look right behind Michael there, if you turn over there, there is an Otis elevator. That's the original elevator that was installed in 1918. I think they've, they've it's, oh look, it's even coming down. How about that? I don't know, can you get a shot of that wall? That's padded with a new material that the DuPont company had recently invented. It's called Fabricoid. And of course, John Raskob was a vice president of the DuPont Fabricoid Company. He was vice president of a heck of a lot of companies, especially DuPont spin-offs. And he had that installed here in the elevator, and he also had it installed in his office, which is today the, the headmaster's office. So this is all a work area. Actually, the elevator does function does. Uh, today yeah. and is still in use. We'll show you a little bit more about that later. But I want to turn you around. There's a really interesting room right behind you where the light is on to the left. Clearly, this room has had many uses right now, obviously, for storage. But uh, we could see from the glass on the door that at one point the school used it for something. And I see a call system on the wall. So probably if the walls could talk. So what was this room? Actually, this was a mystery for quite a while for me. I found a fragment of a blueprint, and most of the blueprint stuff we have were in fragments. And uh, in the original drawings, apparently there were only three staff rooms in the patio itself. There were 11 or 12 over in the garage where we were, on the second floor over there. 
But here, there were only three rooms designated. One for the butler, which would have been on the first floor. One for a, I'm going to guess, a housekeeper, which was on the second floor. And a room for the valet. Now, at that period of time, a valet is somebody who takes care of the clothes of the gentleman who is the owner of the house. Uh, but where did he live in this room? I looked in this room, and as you can see, I'm saying, who in the heck would live down here? That must have been a mistake, or they never used the room, and it puzzled me for the longest time. At another time, later on, I found another uh, plumbing fragment, and I discovered there was a waste drain in this room. And if you can, if you can slide in a little bit, there's a little closet over here, and there was a waste in there. You can see the door hinges. That may have been a bathroom. And then I found another plumbing in thing that said there was a conceal or no, an exposed ceiling radiator in this room. Now we're not doing this to put up peaches for the winter in, in a room like this. But the kicker on the thing was something that Michael referred to a minute ago. If you can look right up on that wall, there's an enunciator panel. And that is a servant call system. You'll see more of that in the house at, at later times. And that must me have meant for sure that this was a used staff room. Uh, now, the valet, I don't know who that was, and I don't know how well that worked out, but at least that was intended as this room. It had heat. Likely it had a bathroom. They would have had to. And then it had a call system for the valet to be summoned to Mr. Raskob whenever he needed. Let's head, let's head down the hall. Okay, you're, you're taking a look into what was the wine cellar for John Raskob. The wine racks that are on the wall were the original ones installed here in 1917, 1918. Uh, he was apparently an aficionado of wine. One of the faculty members many years ago in an old heating duct found a couple of bottles of wine which had a label Chateau Archmere, 1923 and 1924. Now, we don't know if the Raskovs made wine. I don't think they did, but they certainly would have grown table grapes here uh, as well. And as you can see, that that is today a, a storeroom, as many of these basement rooms have actually become with uh, rather strange things in them nowadays. But that would have been a wine cellar at the time. And Tom, we have those uh, wine bottles, as a matter of fact. And uh, for the anniversary celebration of the building's construction in 2018, we resurrected the label. And we now actually do, under a private label, have Chateau Archmere produced again, two reds and two whites that we serve as the house wines when uh, hopefully when we're out of the pandemic and back to having events, uh, they'll be served once again in this house. Sure. Now this room here, if you come down on this side, is obviously the me modern mechanism for the elevator, but that's where the, the winding spools always were located. If you go up to the third floor on the roof, you'll see a little uh, uh, pavilion up there that gives you a little more ceiling height above the roof height, and then the elevator goes all the way up. So again, the service stairs and the elevator are the only way to use the same conveyance to get from the basement all the way up to the top of the building. What's in this next room? Actually, this is a series of rooms that were used for things that one might actually expect in a basement, uh, other than a valet and an elevator room. This was for preserves and storage of vegetables. Uh, the Raskobs actually had an extensive gardening system down near today where the railroad tracks are. Uh, like many other things, it is gone because I-495 went through in the 1960s and removed all that land. Of course, it wasn't cultivated anyway after the Raskobs uh, left. We can actually walk through these two rooms. They're interconnected. As you can see, there, there's a great deal of organ pipe storage down here. That's another story we're working on, and hopefully we'll get to that in the spring. Yeah, another episode. Another episode, right? This might be like Netflix. Uh, <laughs> And there's a ladder that I'm going to use later. So they would have stored, they would have made preserves down here from probably from the garden areas uh, and maybe the table grapes and uh, whatever else they grew. And that would be normal for an estate like this anyway. Remember, you can't pop out to Wawa 
1918 and pick up things. So these rooms would have been work rooms and store rooms for probably food stuff, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, over the years, uh, water and dampness have taken its toll. Originally, these windows would have been uh, open windows, uh, bro bronze windows, actually. They cranked out, and over the years, they were removed because of water leaks and glass block installed. But then, of course, that didn't allow for proper air circulation. And just within the last 10 years, we were able to excavate all the exterior foundations of the house and put in uh, new window wells and better drainage to alleviate some of the issue. So you'll see this portion of the house has not been renovated in any way. And this is what we found pretty much in the whole house, not only in the basement, but on other floors as well, deterioration of the plaster due to the lack of uh, appropriate airflow over the years. Great. Should we continue? So as you can see, there, there is a lot of storage space here. And we even haven't, we really even haven't tapped all the space down here yet. There's still, there's still a lot more to see. This room is really an interesting room because you'll see as you turn the corner, there's a well head in that room. And that well was dug down 90 feet. And the water that came up through that was piped into part of the system that helped take care of air conditioning the patio and in our next in the next space we're going to visit I hope I'll be able to give you some kind of idea how that might have worked we're not absolutely sure of course but that well was an important component of uh, what today we would call HVAC hello so sorry we have to interrupt the tour but we've run out of time so stay tuned for episode two when we'll continue our tour of the basement with Tom and we'll learn a lot more about our HVAC system and other parts of the basement we've yet to explore. So until then, may your basements be warm and dry. And may the warmth of family and friends be in your homes always. God bless.